All right, uh, good to see you gentlemen again. It's been quite a while since I've taught you, but I'm glad to be back to it. And we are starting today to teach a course on personal evangelism. And so this is class one, and today and the next couple of weeks, I believe, um, I'll be teaching on kind of some general things about a personal evangelism. I'm starting today with the imperatives of the Great Commission, which imperative means the orders, the commandments of the Great Commission. So just what is it that God uh, has told us to do? Who has He addressed that commandment to? Uh, and the extent of it and that kind of thing. So uh, we'll start off with Matthew chapter 28 and we'll cover uh, verses 19 and, uh, 18, 19 and 20 at this time. So uh, he says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Okay, well what can we take from these verses uh, regarding what God has commanded us to do. First of all, he says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. So we are to go to all nations. So wherever people are, we are supposed to go. So go ye therefore and teach. The word teach in this instance means to make disciples. So the Great Commission starts with winning souls, but goes beyond to producing believers that are learners and that are obedient to Christ. The idea of discipleship means to be learning uh, from someone, becoming a disciple of that person, a follower of that person, and even in some instances in Scripture goes to the point of imitating uh, that person of whom you are a disciple. So we are to make people disciples of Christ. Obviously, Discipleship has to start with winning people to the Lord. If they're not born again, they will not be a disciple. And so we need to um, start off with soul winning and then begin teaching them what the Scripture has to say that they are responsible uh, to the Lord for. Okay, so go to all nations, teach all nations, make disciples of all nations, Okay, and then baptize, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So <clears throat> that's our responsibility as well, to baptize them, which baptism, and this is, you know, obviously not a thorough um, explanation of baptism, and maybe someday we'll get to that, but uh, baptize, baptism is publicly identifying yourself as a believer in Christ. So baptism is a step where you say, I am a believer in Christ. I am identifying myself with Christian people and with the Lord himself. Okay, that's what baptism is all about. So we baptize those who have trusted Christ as Savior and have become disciples of Christ. We baptize them, and then he says, teaching them to observe to do all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Okay, so uh, that's the last of the commandments in this passage. So we teach them, which starts off with the gospel and then Christian living and so on. We teach them, they become believers, we baptize them, and then we teach them again. And we are to teach them to do as the apostles have done. Okay, so whatever Christ told the apostles to do, they were to spread to others. And, of course, they would continue to spread that message so that the gospel could eventually, uh, hopefully, prayerfully, reach the entire world. Um, we're going to go through each of the four gospels and see the Great Commission in each of the four gospels. Uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, known as the Synoptic Gospels, uh, there is a very direct commandment that the Lord gives what to do. Th there is a commandment in 
John, but it's a little more um, a little more indirect. Okay, it's not as obvious as the first three Gospels. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, this one is very, very direct. And he said unto them, and he's speaking to the eleven. In each of these passages, he has the eleven disciples or apostles uh, by themselves. And he's speaking to them. Okay, so he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So again, he starts off, go. Go ye into all the world. Um, in Matthew, he said all nations. Here he's saying to all the world. Okay? Wherever men are found, go and preach the gospel. And he says preach to every person. Okay? To every creature. Every person should hear the gospel. Man, woman, boy, girl, whatever nation, or whatever they, how they may define themselves, if they're a human being, they need to hear the gospel. So, preach to every person in all nations the gospel of Christ. Um, gospel, of course, meaning good news. Well, what is this good news? Uh, Paul gives it in a nutshell, and we will be spending a good bit of time in this course showing exactly what is the gospel and what does God require of a lost person in order to benefit from the gospel message. Okay, the gospel in a nutshell, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 tells us that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, the New Testament authors go into great detail about what the gospel is and what it means. And they go into great de detail as to what we must tell the lost that they must do in order to be saved. And we'll be talking about this a lot uh, in later classes. But for this, at this point, Mark tells us, go. Okay, he tells the eleven, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, I don't know what the population of the world was at that time, much smaller than today, I'm sure. But obviously, the physical size of the world at that time was the same as it is today. <clears throat> and the means of travel in that day were far more primitive than they are now, far more difficult. It was quite unusual for a person to go more than a few miles from his home in that day. And so for the 11 to go into all the world is obviously impossible. There had to be other people who would take up the cause, take that commission, and go with it themselves. Uh, in Luke uh, chapter 24 and verse uh, 46, he said unto them, uh, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Verse 47, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Again, this is spoken to the eleven, not to a huge crowd, but to the eleven apostles. Uh, they are to take the message of the death and resurrection of Christ uh, to the world. Okay, it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Okay, so we have the death and the resurrection, and this is what they have to take. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached. The message is that forgiveness of sins is found in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Men receive forgiveness of sins from Christ. And this has to be spread among all nations. All right? Um, then we get to John chapter 17. Uh, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And like I said, this is, in the Gospel of John, it's not as, as direct, as obvious, 
uh, as the Great Commission is in the other three Gospels. Um, so in 17, this is, is what we often call the Lord's Prayer, um, not the one that begins, you know, Our Father which art in heaven, which was a model of prayer. It was an example of prayer. But this is Christ praying for his disciples. He says, For I have given unto them, the eleven disciples, the words <clears throat> which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And then in verse 20, let's see, that was, pardon me, that was John 7, 17, verse 8. I think I said 18, I meant 8. And then 17, 18, and now 17, 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Okay, so Christ says that the Father had sent him into the world to deliver a message. And that message was about salvation through himself, through his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, so he preached that message. He gave it to the apostles. They received it. And they understood that Christ came from God for the purpose of dying for the sins of the world. And they believed in him. Okay, and so then he says, as you sent me, as the Father sent Christ to the world, now Christ is sending the apostles to the world. Okay, and he says, I'm not praying for them only, not just these 11, but also for all them which shall believe on me through their word. We, we see a, a progression here. We see a passing on, uh, you know, passing the baton, passing the torch, okay, that, that Christ told the apostles, the apostles told others, they believed and began to tell others who told others and told others and told others until finally, after nearly 2,000 years, it has come down to us Someone told us, and now it's our job to pass this on to others and to tell them. Okay, so uh, what do we see here? Uh, they were sent with Jesus' words to the world. They were to take the message that Jesus gave them to the world. The message is the message of forgiveness of sins through Christ, and this message is to all men and they need to know it. Uh, Christ prayed for the apostles, but also for those that would believe through their message. Uh, okay, so let's, let's wrap this up. We'll add some more uh, through some other verses here, but to whom was the commission given? It was given to the 11 surviving apostles. Through them, to new disciples who were commanded to do what the apostles had done. In other words, continue to pass the message on. Um, in Acts chapter, one, uh, pardon me, Acts chapter 8, uh, it says in verse 1, part B of that verse, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. You might remember this is right after the death of Stephen. He was stoned to death. And right after that, great persecution arose in Jerusalem, and many of the believers had to flee. But notice it's interesting. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Okay, and that's important. You'll see in just a moment. Verse 4 says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Okay, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. They didn't have to flee. I think the reason for that is they had been performing miracles. People had been healed. All kinds of wonderful things had been done in the name of the Lord. And because of that, the apostles had great favor with the people. And so this persecution that arose didn't touch them but the common, ordinary, everyday believers 
were in jeopardy, and they had to flee. So they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, and what did they do? They went everywhere preaching the word. They were not apostles. They were not ordained. They were not evangelists. They were not, all they were were believers, just Christian believers, and they went everywhere preaching the word. I, I am emphasizing this because I know in America, and I would not be surprised if you have this problem to some degree in India, uh, but in America there are a lot of Christians who behave as though the paid ministers, the pastors of the churches, and so on, it's their job to spread the gospel, but it's not the common ordinary believer that sits in the pew, that goes to church once or twice or three times a week. It's not their duty to spread the gospel. And so they are surrounded by friends, family, co-workers, neighbors who don't know the gospel, but they will not take it to them. They're waiting for the pastor to do it. And you know that the job of reaching the world cannot be left to the pastors. There are not nearly enough pastors to spread the gospel to the whole world. We have got to have the cooperation and the help of ordinary believers. Okay, And in Jerusalem and outside of Jerusalem, that's what happened. They had to run for their lives because of persecution but then they went to the areas around Jerusalem and Samaria and told them the gospel. Um, 2 Timothy 2.2 2, uh, puts in words a concept that I've been talking about here. The Apostle Paul speaking, and he says, And the things, talking to Timothy, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Okay, and so this shows this continuing progression from the beginning until today. Okay, the things that thou hast heard of me. So we've got the Apostle Paul, and he is teaching Timothy among others. It says among many witnesses. So he's teaching Timothy and others, and he says those things that I told you, you need to commit to faithful men so that they can teach others also. So you've got four generations there. Paul, Timothy, the men Timothy taught, and then the men that they taught. And so it just keeps getting passed down and passed down and passed down and passed down. And as I said before, uh, someone told you, okay, I was led to Christ by a man named Jim Williamson. And I'm so very, very grateful that he came and sat down in our dining room at the dining room table and led my older sister and myself to the Lord. Uh, we were teenagers and we trusted Christ that day. And that's, I think it'll be 57 years um, this January. Okay, so this, this is what the, the Great Commission is all about. Okay, there, there is even a kind of a, a, a movement in America. I don't know if it's a movement because it's, it's not really going anywhere. Um, but there's, there's a group of people in America who have decided that the Great Commission was given to the 11 only and was to be fulfilled in their lifetime. Now that is absolutely absurd. Expecting those 11 men to spread the gospel to the whole world in their lifetime is just not possible. As far as we know historically, the farthest that any of the apostles got from Jerusalem was the apostle Thomas who went to India. Okay, Mark, uh, Peter's disciple, was supposed to have gone uh, and may have gone to Ethiopia, which is just a short distance down the continent of Africa. And so huge portions of the world were not reached. Um, 
Joseph of Arimathea. There is a, an old legend in India, in, uh, pardon me, old legend in England. Whether it's true or not, we don't know. You know, legends, sometimes there's something behind them and sometimes it's just something somebody made up. But there is a legend that Joseph of Arimathea went to England and preached the gospel in the first century A.D. And it could be. There was um, trade back and forth between what is today England and the Middle East for centuries before Christ. And so it's possible that that happened, but it may not have. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that those 11 men, and even a few of their friends and acquaintances, some of their, their followers, there's no way that first generation could have reached the world for Christ. That job has been passed down to us, okay? Um, so what we see in these messages, these passages about the Great Commission, is that our message is that the death of Christ for our sins and His resurrection from the dead is the only way of salvation. There is no other way. And it, isn't it a wonderful thing to be able to say, we have a risen Savior. The Lord Jesus is alive. Um, Confucius is dead, Buddha is dead, Mohammed is dead. Okay, every religious leader the world has ever known has died, but Jesus died for our sin and then rose from the dead and is alive today and able to save anyone who will come to him. So that's our message. Uh, the commission is to take this message to all nations, and every people. If you look at the world and you look at history, then you realize that the church has done a very poor job of reaching the whole world. We have not fulfilled the Great Commission. Um, there are huge portions of the world today that there are people who've never heard of the Lord Jesus. Never heard. There are many, many others who've heard vague things, falsehoods, and so on, um, but they've never heard the true gospel of Christ. There are many, many professing Christians in this world who are not truly Christians because they're relying upon their church or their religious rituals or their personal goodness or something like that to save their souls. And uh, they're not trusting Christ. The death of Christ means little to them. And of course, there's an awful lot of people, especially here in America and in Europe, who name the name of Christ. They're nominal Christians, but the truth is they don't believe the Bible. They don't believe Christ was God. They don't believe the virgin birth. They don't believe his resurrection from the dead or that his death was to pay for sin. So um, we have done a pretty poor job of telling the world about Christ. Uh, the commission was given to the apostles and through them to every believer until Christ returns. Okay, this is our job. It remains unfinished. Okay, and we need to finish the job.